HudsonRiverRadio.com. Music, talking, con. What can go wrong? Good evening, everyone. Please take your seats, get out your notebooks, and focus. It's time to put on your thinking caps and explore Hudson Valley history. So call in and let's talk history with Ms. Lorenzo. The number is 845-553-9606. Class is now in session at HudsonRiverRadio.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. I'm your host, Jennifer Lorenzo, and we're so glad to welcome James Kirby Martin back to Let's Talk History. Uh, James Kirby Martin's academic teaching career includes stops at Rutgers University, the University of Houston, the Citadel, and the United States Military Academy at West Point. He is the author or editor of 14 books, including Benedict Arnold, Revolutionary Hero, An American Warrior Reconsidered, A Respectable Army, The Military Origins of the Republic, 1763 to 1789, Forgotten Allies, the Oneida Indians, and the American Revolution, and Insurrection, the American Revolution, and its meaning. Among his professional activities, Martin has served as an historian consultant to the United Indian Nation of New York and a book series advisory editor to Oxford University Press, New York University Press, and West Home Publishing. And I'd also like to say he's very generous to teachers and uh, gives several, several opportunities for teachers to learn all about American history at summer institutes. And that's originally where I had met you up at Fort Ticonderoga. So thank you for the work you do for teachers as well. And, and welcome back to uh, Hudson River Radio and Let's Talk History. Sounds good. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be back. And uh, yes, I've done a number of uh, teacher institutes in the summer, primarily through uh, Fort Ticonderoga. And I think that's where you first met. So yes. Indeed it was. And, and they still are going strong because I'm going to do another one this summer. Excellent. Uh, I, really, I really enjoy them. It's, it's, a, it's really wonderful to be in contact, face-to-face -face contact, to get the feedback. Uh, because uh, sometimes, if I could be very honest, we academics can get disconnected and spend too much time talking among ourselves and not enough time really reaching out uh, and... Uh, uh, becoming useful uh, resources for uh, many wonderful teachers that are out there. So uh, anyway, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And today you're here to talk about your latest novel, uh, Surviving Dresden, which is a novel about life, death, and redemption in World War II. So, and I just finished reading it, and it is fabulous, and I highly suggest all of our listeners read it as well. So how and why did you get involved in writing this novel? Well, that is a story that goes back uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, back in uh, 2010, uh, my wife and I went uh, to Germany just to go touring. Hadn't been there. Actually, I'd been there when I was a kid, but I uh, hadn't been for years and years and years. And uh, uh, my wife is German in her background uh, through her family line. Uh, and we just sort of went touring around and we end up in this beautiful uh, cultural city. Uh, the name of which is Dresden, uh, sort of, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's just, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's a gorgeous city. Well, the point about that is it's gorgeous today because it's rebuilt, because it was bombed into oblivion back in 1945, in February of 1945. And there are all sorts of controversial issues about that bombing, obviously bombed by the Allies at a point when the war wasn't really over again, February of 1945. Uh, but uh, uh, as some have argued, uh, perhaps too much bombing in this case took place uh, because after all, everyone knew the Germans were going to lose. Well, the problem with that is Adolf Hitler didn't know that. And he didn't believe that. And he really had his population stirred up, fighting to the end, uh, Hitler would tell you, you've so disappointed me. You haven't lived up. We don't have, we're, we're not realizing the dream of the Third Reich. It's all your fault. Uh, fight until the death. That was the message to the German people in February of 1945. Well, if that's the case, how are you going to end the war? How do you stop the killing of the war, which is one of the concerns in this particular story, in this novel? 
how do you stop the killing when the killing won't stop? Uh, and one of the ways you, the Allies try to do that is by bombing German cities. Uh, and that's really how the story of J uh, Dresden takes place because here it's, it's perceived as the uh, Florence of the Elba, that is the Elba River, which runs through the city. Uh, and uh, why would you want to destroy this cultural Mecca? Why? And, and, the, and the answer to that is that there are, as I can say, a number of good reasons to do so uh, in terms of you, you look at the map of the war and what is going on. I'll give you very quickly here. One, it's a major railroad center. The Germans can move troops east. They can move troops west. They are moving troops from uh, the west to the east at this point because the Russians are coming in. If you consider Dresden, it's about 100 miles south of Berlin. The Russians are going to attack Berlin. They're on the cusp in February of 45 of pulling that off, but they're also concerned about their southern flank. So taking in and controlling Dresden is very important to them. So it's a railroad mecca. So we got to stop that flow of troops back and forth. There's a lot of manufacturing going on underground. One of our main characters, uh, a woman by the name of Gisela Kaufman, and she is a fictional comp compilation of several women who were involved in the war at this point in time. Uh, she is half Jewish. She is working basically as a slave laborer, laborer uh, in, a, in a factory uh, where they are making uh, uh, these bombing devices that is the, that would detonate the bombs uh, as they either hit the ground or before the ground. And uh, so that's typical. There were, according to surveys after the war, somewhere between 110 and 130 major uh, manufacturing establishments in Dresden supporting the city, supporting the war, supporting Hitler. And so if you want to end the war, one of the things you've got to do is you obviously have to cut off uh, the supplies that are being produced that are supporting the war. Uh, and these are the, these are the kinds of reasons that come into play uh, that mean Dresden is probably a legitimate target. So was Dresden an innocent city, as is often claimed, after the war? Well, that is one of the great claims after the war, but I would say that from my own research, and we, we, we try to really not force an answer on the reader, if I could put it that way. Rather, we want the reader to think about this, to think about the circumstances. And th this, is, this is the way, I think, one of, the, one of the good ways to, to do that is to understand that the Allies are, are selecting certain targets. This is an air war going on. I mean, that's kind of the big, one of the big deals in World right. War II. Uh, and you say, what, what points are we, can we strike? Where can we bomb that will make, that will make a difference? Uh, and there was, there's a meeting going on in the background, a very famous meeting at Yalta, the Yalta Conference. Uh, and that involves, and that's in early February of 1945, and Franklin Roosevelt is there, uh, uh, Churchill is there, and Joseph Stalin is there. And Joseph Stalin is saying, you can help us, you allies, our other allies, Stalin said this all the time, you're not knowing enough, you know, you, you just, we have borne the burn of the war. And when you look at uh, the death certificate, I mean, the, 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 the number of deaths literally the Russians are in the millions, and the uh, other allies are more in the hundreds of thousands. And so he's saying, do something to help me. And I think if you would take out this particular city and perhaps some others in the area, that will help me move much more quickly, both uh, westward to take Dresden, but then to move northward in the whole process of taking Berlin. And after all, they didn't know. They didn't know where th how things were going to turn out at that point. So... Is it a legit, legitimate military target? I would argue yes, but was it overbombed? I would also say yes. <laughs> so there, if, and I don't mean to be inconsistent when I say this, but part of the problem was a plan to bomb cities like Dresden uh, had been around for at least a year or so. And it was debated among the Allies, especially among the Brits and the Americans. Should we go in and bomb this city or that city? A lot of it was directed toward, toward Berlin. The plan was uh, thunderclap, uh, was, was sort of 
uh, set aside. And then it got reinvigorated in all this turmoil about how are we going to get this war to end? Uh, going back to uh, uh, what we were just talking about uh, in terms of the meetings at Yalta. And so the plan then is turned over to one of the most controversial characters of the whole Second, Second World War. Uh, his name is Sir Arthur Harris, sometimes called Bomber Harris. He is in charge of British Bomber Command. And Harris then, whose attitude is, you bombed us way back in 40, if you go back to uh, you bombed Berlin and you bombed other cities uh, in England, you did it, you started it, we have every right to bomb you right back. And so he comes up with a plan that is multifold to take out Dresden or an alternate target. Dresden is the one that's going to be hit on the evening of February 13th and into the 14th of 1945. And it's to send wave after wave of uh, these what we call heavy bombers uh, to strike the city. Uh, and strike they did. And when I mean numbers, um, I don't have the max, not exact numbers in front of me, but in the first raid, because it comes in multiple waves, in the first raid, uh, it was over 250, uh, if I remember the number correctly, Lancaster bombers. That's the main big bomber of the English going after the city. And they're dropping uh, uh, blockbusters, but they're also dropping incendiary bombs. These incendiary bombs, you hit, you hit the ground with a blockbuster and you shake up everything around it to blow it apart. Then you throw in the incendiaries, uh, and that's what these planes are carrying, and you throw them in on top of that, and you have this you know, horrible situation where these awful fires begin, like firestorms, and everything begins to go up into flames, and that's where a lot of this destruction takes place. Well, the first group did a magnificent job of... of uh, <laughs> how do I say this politely, really mangling the city. But then the plan went on to have a second raid of Lancaster bombers. And one of our main characters in the story, uh, a man named Wallace Campbell, will be involved in that raid. And he has great doubts about it all. Uh, and that's why he's such an important character, because not everybody wanted to destroy everything in sight. But, but uh, Campbell's involved in the second raid. He has great deal of turmoil, should we go ahead and drop the bombs given what we're seeing from the air in terms of the, the massive destruction on the ground? And I'm not going to tell the reader what's going to happen in that situation. But now the number of bombers, these Lancasters, is in the four or 500 category. Again, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. And so that's the second bombing. And if you didn't destroy it the first time, you really destroyed it the second time. But wait, there's more. <laughs> it's right. the expression goes. Right. <laughs> and that is, the Americans have an assignment, and they go in with B-17s, which is their top bomber. I know that some people would argue the B-24, but that's to say the B-17, the Flying Fortress, uh, is a class plane, crews of 10. I don't want to get started on all of that. But they go in with the third raid early in the morning of February 14th. And some of those planes, because we also talk about that story, and introduce another character who's heavily involved in this, um, and uh, so what you have then uh, is the third group goes in and they're going, what are we supposed to do? Some of them actually went and bombed in other areas or just blocked their, dropped their bombs out in fields or went home, never dropping their bombs, which of course was a great risk because they're all flying out of uh, uh, bases in England. Um, right. And anyway, it is total destruction. But here's a very important point that this gets involved in English politics as the war is beginning to end. Is this a bomb, throwing bombs too far? And it leads to all sorts of criticism of Churchill. The, actually, the, after the war, very quickly, Churchill will be set aside. The Labor Party will come into power. Uh, Bomber Harris will be ridiculed for this. Uh, and authors will start to write that this wasn't really just bombing for the sake of bombing for the winning of the war. This was purposeful human slaughter with no good, you know, just killing innocent civilians for the sake of trying to end the war. And a lot of this will then come out in a book uh, written by a man, very controversial author, David Irving. He did, believes he believes in the myth of the six million, you know, which I don't. I mean, I think, I think a lot of that is nonsense. A lot of it, if not all of it. 
But the, but the point is, he writes a book about the bombing of Dresden called Apocalypse. It catches on. And he uses statistics that were, were ginned up uh, on the German side because it's become the bombing becomes a propaganda issue immediately in February, late February of 1945, a propaganda issue. And uh, Joseph Goebbels is the master, Hitler's maps, master propagandist. We all know about you know, how do we say it? News that's sort of made up, right. propaganda. Right. That goes on all the time in human history. Uh, and so Goebbels then gets involved. And what they do is they, first of all, create a scene, which no one else can do because the Germans still control the city uh, up until April of 45. And they start piling the bodies way up and taking pictures of them. Then he comes out with a number uh, in the city of maybe half a million at this point, if not, if not that many, over 200, in fact, his figures, 205,000 were killed. In other words, this was, according to Irving, and it's, tr it's true if you believe that number, because Irving just cuts it in half and says it was well over 100,000, then he compares it to Hiroshima, wow. which is dropping the atomic bomb on Japan, and by golly, uh, the estimate for Hiroshima is about 80,000. So the bombing of Dresden was worse if it was over 100,000 than the bombing of Hiroshima. And so that story builds. Now, the point very quickly is the real number that is agreed upon by a commission that studied this very carefully within the last 20 years is 22 to 25,000, which is bad. Right. But it's not the worst in terms of bombing German cities. Really, the worst is probably Hamburg in 1943, which over a series of raids, over 40,000 people on the ground lost their lives. But then again, that's the moral issue. You know, are we killing, killing civilians? That's not fair. But what do you do in the era, era of modern warfare when you have air power and you're using it uh, because uh, it's there and it's available and you're not defeating so far, they weren't defeating the Germ Germans completely on land, neither the Americans, or the Brits, or the Russians, for that matter. And you do such a great job in the, the novel of explaining all that. And I, so I think our readers really learn a lot about all these events by reading the novel. So I think between uh, your conversations... That was, that, was, that was really one of our, our goals. Good novels, from my point of view, and after all, I'm a practicing historian, and mostly, most of my writing, hopefully, has been nonfiction. I wasn't making things up along the way. Uh, is well grounded in the history of the time. It's so very, very important from from my point of view. And I I read novels that are just fabricated throw in a few characters, have a nice sweet story or a love story or whatever else it might be. And sort of, oh, it could have happened in 1950 or could have happened in uh, 1730 for that matter. Uh, and what Bob Burris, my co-author and uh, co-writer in terms of uh, projects we've been involved in, um, that, that uh, what we really want is we want that background to be as realistic and accurate as possible. And then what we do is we take real people, real characters. I mean, I'm not going to shock anybody with the news. Adolf Hitler was real and really, really bad at the same time. Uh, the uh, man uh, who was the Gauleiter, or that is the regional leader in Saxony, that is the most powerful Nazi in the area where Dresden is located, Martin Muchman, is a real character. And he does get played out. Now, we have a scene where they're having when the bomb, just as the scene, the bombing has started, this happened to be a particular holiday on the German calendar, uh, Fasching it's called, and they were having a celebration in, 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 in an evening party, and then the bombing is going to sort of take place around this. That's The party is fictionalized, but it's based on the reality of what was going on uh, at the time. Muchman was a nasty guy. He was not a nice man. In fact, the Russians didn't like him so much because they captured him after the war, uh, or you know, maybe it wasn't after the war, it was close to the end of the war. And they captured him and they hauled him off to Russia. And, and uh, they found they were so disgusted by him, they said, you're such an evil man, they hanged him in 1947. Now that's the true story, but he's there. And he's in, 
he's in a real but also a fictionalized real setting that is meant to be accurate. But then our main characters, like let's take our friend Wallace Campbell, who's the main male character. Wallace Campbell is a man with a conscience. He doesn't know how the war is going to end. He knows that the killing needs to stop. And he's gotten to the point, he's been on so many of these bombing runs. Some of these guys did survive through 20, 30 bombing missions, and they were the lucky ones, actually, uh, not being knocked out of this guy. And, and uh, in his case, he's begun to question this. How can we just stop this? Isn't there some way where we can sit down and settle our differences peacefully? And so here is this top gun, so to speak, in terms of flying Land Lancaster airplanes, those, those big bombers, who's beginning to have doubts and isn't sure this is the right thing to do. And he can't predict what's going on in the future. I mean, after all, he's in February of 1945. But then Gisela, Gisela Kaufman, uh, on the ground in Dresden, uh, half Jewish, father is uh, Lutheran, mother is fully Jewish. Uh, she's trapped. The only reason, by the way, that she hasn't been sent off to the camps, and we talk about that in the, in the novel, uh, and going to the camps really was, at this point in time, was a death trip for all practical purposes, is that the law sort of, the final solution sort of protected, protects her up to a point because uh, she is half Aryan. But by, the, by that time, that's off. So she will actually receive a message, be at the train station early on the morning of February 14th, you and your mother and your younger brother, okay, and your mother is fully Jewish, and we are going to put you on the train, and we're going to haul you off to a camp, and we talk about that, the Stutkoff, I don't think I ever say it right, uh, camp, which is way north, uh, but uh, uh, is still open. The Germans still control it in February of 45. But the problem for her is she's trying to get out, and we deal with that. She's trying to work a deal to get, you know, to get out of the city so she can avoid this and, and save the life of her family. What happens is she can't get on the train on February 14th. And this is actually based on a real incident in the war. She can't get on the train. Why? Because the train station got blown off the face of the earth late on the evening of February 13th. That bombing saved her life with all of the irony that you can imagine. When so many died, it actually saved her and others that were in her kind of a situation. A bit ironic given that the Germans with their final solution, and I shouldn't say Germans, I don't mean to blank in everyone, but I really mean Adolf Hitler's super Nazi types right. wanted to destroy uh, this, this whole group of people. So those are the kind of things that we do. Those are the kind of things that we deal with. Um, and frankly, in the end, I think we put it together in a way. So it's a page turner. Uh, what's going to happen to these people? How's it going to work out? That is both our fictionalized characters and our real characters. And so from that point of view, um, I think it deals with some very, very important questions. And that is one of them, when you don't know what the future, and a lot of people say, well, the war was almost over, but they didn't know that in February. They didn't know when the war was going to end in February of 1945. They didn't know that Adolf Hitler was going to commit. So, well, some people think he was Argentina, but right. I'm, a, I'm among those who think the evidence is overwhelming that he blew his brains out, thank God, uh, on April 30th of 1945 down in his bunker uh, in Berlin. Uh, and so for, from my point of view, they didn't know that was going to happen. He was throwing everybody into the service, old men, young boys, militia, whatever it was, fight to the death. So how are you going to end that? And that's really a dilemma uh, in which there's no easy answer, but individuals I hopefully would ponder that kind of an issue and have a, a, a real understanding of the dilemma of war, if nothing else. It's not, these are not easy solutions. Uh, it's not easy to bring an end to something where literally millions of people, maybe as many as 50 million have died between 1939 and 1945. I'm only talking about Europe. I'm not even mentioning the war in the Pacific. Yeah, it's just in incredible, the, the bloodshed and the, the lives lost during the entire war. It's, it's... Absolutely. No doubt so, about it. so we'll take a quick break and we'll 
I uh, have a couple last questions after this break. We'll be right back on HudsonRiverRadio.com and let's talk history. HudsonRiverRadio.com, your local Rockland County station. Hey, Kirk Allen of All About the Money. I don't want to go all Gordon Gecko on you and say greed is good. But knowing about money is important. Picking the right places for your money really means a lot. So listen to me on All About the Money. Catch it on all the popular podcast platforms. Subscribe to All About the Money on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. This President's Day, celebrate American legends with great deals at the Jeep President's Day event. Right now, get 0% financing for 72 months on select 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee models. Excludes Grand Cherokee L, SRT, and Trackhawk. 0% APR financing for 72 months equals $1,389 per month per $1,000 finance for a qualified buyers through Chrysler Capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 228-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. They say to truly understand someone, you must walk a mile in their shoes. Well, at Lexus, we designed the ES with you in mind every step of the way. From class-leading legroom to positioning the touchscreen four inches closer. Everything in the Lexus ES, a direct reflection of you. Click the banner to discover more. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. 2022 ES versus 2021-2022 competitors. Information from manufacturers' websites as of 5-3-2021. They say to truly understand someone, you must walk a mile in their shoes. Well, at Lexus, we designed the ES with you in mind every step of the way. From class-leading legroom to positioning the touchscreen four inches closer. Everything in the Lexus ES, a direct reflection of you. Click the banner to discover more. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. 2022 ES versus 2021-2022 competitors. Information from manufacturers' websites as of 5 2021 Hey, Yvonne, do you know what Tony the Rooster is telling you? Hey, Allison, of course I do. That's right. Tony wants you to join us for Getting Dirty on HudsonRiverRadio.com. You'll learn all about gardening, local farming and farmers, and why it's cool to get dirty. Join us because it's awesomely awesome. Subscribe to Getting Dirty on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com. The dot com makes it cool. Welcome back to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. I'm your host, Jennifer Lorenzo, and we are glad to welcome James Kirby Martin back. We are having a fabulous discussion on his latest novel, Surviving Dresden, a novel about life, death, and redemption in World War II. And I really suggest our listeners get a copy, buy a copy. It's just a wonderful way of weaving real life events and characters with some fic- fictional characters and weaving them together and really bringing to the forefront the story of the bombing of Dresden. So Jim, why does Dresden keep coming up? Why is the story still coming up in 2022? Well, part of the reason has to do with the theme of overkill. Because this is, it, this is an example of, did the plan go too far? The city was really ravished in the first bombing. Why do we have the second? Why do we have the third? And that actually is a little bit even beyond that. Uh, why this kind of brutal kind of destruction, we can say. And that's the issue, the issue of brutality. Uh, it goes to... Uh, the story that how many really got killed. And then you have the David Irving types out there that say uh, they killed hundreds of thousands, they killed more than 100,000, you know, more than Hiroshima. And so that will be kicked around by uh, some historians. Uh, And then you also uh, sort of have other kinds of uh, considerations besides besides that. The city um, is taken over by the Russians, ends up in East German, Germany. And that's also part of the problem because the Russians moved in. They were were, were probably just as bad as the the Germans were in terms of treating the civilian populace and uh, after after all the bombing. And they sort of took over and did nothing. They just let the city lie there in rubble for 30 or 40 years. Uh, Having been there very briefly, they built one of the ugliest apartment buildings I've ever seen. Uh, But that didn't 
That didn't stop them from moving in and throwing out Germans uh, uh, and taking over their property and living in it comfortably and everything like that. Uh, and then they were, they were literally, we go back, uh, we go back to 1988, 89 and the, uh, uh, the end of the Berlin Wall, uh, and then we get into the stage when East Germany and West Germany begin to reunite and the Russians pull back and pull out, thankfully. And then you get into the story of reconstructing the city. And a very interesting part of that is this huge, beautiful church that literally fell apart within 24 hours of the bombing, the Frauenkirche. I don't say that very well. My German is rusty, if non-existent. <laughs> And, and anyway, that becomes a focal point. And there, there is an international campaign to rebuild that church. And it begins in the late 1990s, and it is reconstructed. And by 2005, they have rebuilt it into the magnificent edifice church that it was. Uh, and that, that garners international attention. You know, we're trying to restore from all of this horrible, awful killing. Now, the problem for us in the novel is, is that if we have that, because we end with the story in the Frauenkirk involved, because we jump ahead 50 years, but we go from 45 to 2005 at 60 years. At that point, our main characters would be too old to meet because they haven't met up until this point. I'm not gonna go into any detail about that. And so we decided we would rebuild the church in 1995 and hope no one would notice because they'd only be in their 70s instead of their 80s. <laughs> uh, and that makes the, the ending more convenient. Well, that's the advantage of writing a novel. You don't always have to uh, try to be uh, truthful about these right. things. But that campaign to rebuild this beautiful city, and it has been largely rebuilt, although uh, given those ugly apartments, there are there's, there's ugly marks all over the place. Uh, but if you get into the old city with the opera house, uh, with, with uh, all these gorgeous buildings that were century, centuries old, uh, it's magnificent. And so that brought a lot of attention. But also then the final point along this line is it still was considered a city that should have been safe. It should have been spared from the bombing, all of that sort of thing, because it was this cultural mecca, this cultural center and really was as part of the, the myth, I would say, uh, not a, a city that was in any way involved, sort of isolated from the war, which is really not true. Uh, so that can lead to all the controversy. Then you throw in, why would they bomb it when they knew the war was gonna end? They didn't know the war was gonna end and all of those factors would come into play. So it still is a topic and it goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, uh, well, probably the debate will continue how much longer, I don't know. But I think for a novel, it really was a very good setting for, for Bob, my co-author, and I to select. Right, and it does really bring up the, the one of the central themes of how do you stop the killing when the killing won't stop? You know, it just kept coming and coming, like you had mentioned, and you really have to ask yourself that question. That's right. And that is a very basic uh, question in any kind of war situ wartime situation for instance, believed in area bombing. They, really, they, didn't, they didn't have enough sophistication at that point in time. And they just come over and they drop them. And if they hit something great, if they didn't, so what? The Germans deserved it. It's sort of the attitude. And that's the bomber Harris philosophy. The Americans, on the other hand, this, they had a, a sighting system, the Norden, the Norden, N O R D E N, sighting system. And they could be more precise. The Americans played much more into. Uh, that is a uh, very specific bombing of sites. Uh, and uh, so overall, maybe they, they, weren't as, they weren't as destructive, but still you're dropping bombs on people. There's no way to really control the situation. Then you get into questions of proportionality. Uh, did you go too far in what you were doing? Uh, did you really effectively end the war? Many would argue that the bomb with Dresden made no difference in the long run. I think you can turn it around and argue with the exact opposite that the bombing of Dresden set was one of those key factors setting the stage for the end of Hitler's awful regime. I, I agree. And, and again, just to reiterate what a great job you did in the novel about bringing Thank that you. to life as well. So we'll take one more quick break and then we'll be right back after this message 
We'll be back with uh, James Kirby Martin, author of the book Surviving Dresden, here on HudsonRiverRadio.com, and let's talk history. HudsonRiverRadio.com Hi, this is Big Jim Wheeler. You know, I grew up on a farm as a kid, and, well, back in those days, we didn't have much TV to watch. So as a family, we'd sit around the radio, and we'd listen to those old shows. Well, I've become a huge fan of those classic radio shows, and I'm thrilled to share my personal collection of original broadcast recordings with you. Well, we got old Western superheroes, classic stories. Oh, we got them all. Check out Hudson River Radio's classic radio theater. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss a show. This is Big Jim Wheeler signing off and hoping you enjoy the show. Subscribe to Classic Radio Theater on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. This President's Day, celebrate American legends with great deals at the Jeep President's Day event. Right now, get 0% financing for 72 months on select 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee models. Excludes Grand Cherokee L, SRT, and Trackhawk. 0% APR financing for 72 months equals $1,389 per month per $1,000 finance for all qualified buyers through Chrysler Capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 228-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. This President's Day, celebrate American legends with great deals at the Jeep President's Day event. Right now, get 0% financing for 72 months on select 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee models. Excludes Grand Cherokee L, SRT, and Trackhawk. 0% APR financing for 72 months equals $1,389 per month per $1,000 finance for all qualified buyers through Chrysler Capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 228-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. At Frost Bank, we believe young people are fearless. Look at the two biggest tech companies, both created by people under 25. Or when the world's biggest band flew over from England, they were all under 25. Our youngest customers are capable of amazing achievements, but they're still figuring out who they are. So we help by waiving the monthly service charge on certain accounts for account holders under age 25. It's about supporting the next generation. It's about more than money. Frost Bank. Did you know that there have been over 30,000 reported cases of UFOs in the Hudson Valley? What happens to people when they have very close encounters and missing time? I'm Linda Zimmerman. I'm Michael Warden. Join us for UFO Headquarters. We'll dig into some of the most intense and unnerving UFO sightings that happened right here in our backyard. UFO Headquarters on HudsonRiverRadio.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in our app or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to UFO Headquarters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com Welcome back to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. Again, we're joined by the author James Kirby Martin, author of Surviving Dresden, and before we get to our last question, Jim, I was just, we were just saying how this would be a great book for a college class on World War II. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm all in favor of it. <laughs> because um, uh, from, from my point of view, the book is not overwhelming in length. It deals with war, wartime issues, vital issues. One of the things sometimes we don't understand is if you look at human history, wars are going on all the time. Why? Why is that the case? Why do we, why do we have these circumstances? The rise of Hitler is actually discussed in this, this novel, but very briefly in a way to carry people into the war to understand that this was an international crisis beyond anything the world had seen up until that particular time. How did you solve the problem of defeating the enemy in a situation where up to 50 million people will die in that process? It's actually educational from that point of view because while it's not an anti-war book, that wasn't our purpose at all in writing this kind of a book. It deals with the issues of why maybe you really do want to avoid wars. After all, we've got something going on right now in the background. I was thinking that the whole time I was reading it. Yeah. So, so anyway, I mean, these are timely issues. They're, they're really, if I could use the term, 
universal considerations. I like they that. don't go away and they keep coming up over and over and over again. I know that as a historian in studying various wars, um, I once taught a course at West Point. We covered everything from Greeks and Romans to 1900. And we went from war to war to war in 40 classes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, how much, I don't want to say it has to happen, but humans are sometimes violent people. And they they do. They, they are. Uh, and uh, they get caught up in things. And you've got issues of why do some people so attracted uh, by power? Uh, how do these Hitler types come along? Joseph Stalin was actually one of them. He may have been a bigger butcher than Hitler when it got, when it gets down to the whole story and you look into these things. And I think a book like this introduces these kinds of subjects and teachers can then take off and go in a whole variety of directions, whether it's questions about fighting wars or the diplomacy of war or ending wars or whatever else it might be along that particular line. Um, so actually, uh, from my point of view, it'd be great. It would be absolutely great if it could be used as an educational tool. Uh, that that was one of our, maybe that was actually one of our goals. So I totally agree. And so would you consider this storyline timeless? Well, I do. Yes. And that, that was, at this point for me, uh, I've got lots of subjects I can delve into. And I want to delve into those which do have more than momentary meaning. Uh, and I think when you do that, uh, you have made as an author, and I include Bob Burris in this, my co-author, we have made a contribution and we would be happy for others out there to share in that uh, and to learn from it and uh, understand that these are issues, the more we learn about them, maybe we can do a better job as people. people. Uh, in getting along with one another, if nothing else. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a great way to end the in, interview on, on that great thought and hope for the future, I think. So again, thank you to James Kirby Martin for joining us again. We're very excited to have you back uh, talking about his novel, uh, Surviving Dresden, a novel about life, death, and redemption in World War II. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And I Really highly suggest all of our listeners uh, go out and purchase the book and read it. It's it's great. And again, great job to you and your co-author on this book. It, it was a really great read. And and like I said, it, we, it does a good job of weaving real life events and some uh, historical fiction and novel ideas together. And it's a, a great blend. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. And uh... Uh, Jennifer, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this evening. And uh, uh, yes, hopefully, if, if an author can write a book that makes a difference, it's worth all the effort. Well, and, and you sure did. So thank you for your effort. And I look forward to any uh, other things you have coming down the, the pike. I know you said you have a couple things on the, very, on the horizon. Very process. So, and you have an open invitation anytime to come back and talk to us about you. your your newest endeavor. So have a great night. And thanks again to James Kirby Martin, author of Surviving Dresden. Thanks to Neil, our rector, our board operator, and go out and make history. Have a great night, everyone. HudsonRiverRadio.com. This President's Day, celebrate American legends with great deals at the Jeep President's Day event. Right now, get 0% financing for 72 months on select 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee models. Excludes Grand Cherokee L, SRT, and Trackhawk. 0% APR financing for 72 months equals $1,389 per month per $1,000 finance for all qualified buyers through Chrysler Capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 228-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. This President's Day, celebrate American legends with great deals at the Jeep President's Day event. Right now, get 0% financing for 72 months on select 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee models. 
Excludes Grand Cherokee L, SRT, and Trackhawk. 0% APR financing for 72 months. Equals $1,389 per month per 1,000 finance for all qualified buyers through Chrysler Capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 228-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC.